Joining me now to discuss Bitcoin's meteoric rise is our Week in Review panel. Coinus Managing Editor of Markets, Brad Cowan in Austin, and Research Analyst George Kaloudis in North Carolina. Welcome, Brad and George. Thank you, Christine. All right, great to see you. So hey, thanks, thanks Christine. So Bitcoin is gearing up for a new record high, Brad. I mean, uh, all-time high is just under $65,000. Uh, what, what kind of technical indicators are you seeing? We know that this is because of the anticipation over a Bitcoin futures ETF that may get approval as soon as Monday. Well, yeah, I mean, we're having a, a really good pop today. I think it was up 7% on the day. So that is a pretty big move, even for Bitcoin. And, uh, you know, we've come up, I think last week we talked about how we had, we, would, we went up $10,000 last week. And uh, I was just looking at, we're up, I guess, another $8,000 over the past week. So it's been a pretty, pretty rapid climb here from, you know, we were just in the low 40s uh, two weeks ago. And here we are looking at the all-time high, um, and it sort of shows how fast things can turn around. And uh, once again, you know, the driver here of Bitcoin these days is investment demand. I'm, it sounds kind of like a truism to say that, but that is primary use case for Bitcoin right now is as an investment. Um, and people are buying it as a speculation and, and betting that the price will go up. And and so now here, you know, people are piling in in anticipation of a lot of potentially extra demand coming next week as these uh, BFs get approved. And, and you know, we've, we've been sort of tracking the, the companies behind these ETFs are already working to just make sure they're ready to go out of the gate next week. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, behind this, the, there's news that there is an ETF, a uh, Bitcoin futures ETF that may get approval from the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, you know, on October 18th, ProShares Bitcoin strategy ETF is going to uh, potentially have a, a decision or rather a non-decision. We're, according to Bloomberg, they're reporting that uh, the SEC will allow their application to expire, which is effectively a tacit approval of their Bitcoin futures ETF on October 19th. The Vesco is also up October 25th. We've got Van Eck Bitcoin strategy ETF as well as Calcury Bitcoin strategy ETF. So four in the running this month. Uh, any idea as to whether or not this might happen one by one or all at once so as to avoid giving first mover advantage to any particular firm, George? Yeah, it's, that's actually a very good question. I don't know the answer to that, but I tend to agree that they're not going to just give one of these uh, firms an advantage over another one. It's It would seem completely unfair to say, hey, Invesco, you guys get get the uh, the leg up here. Uh and it's, it's funny to see this happening right now in front of me, seeing all these firms listed here, because we've been talking about institutions coming into the space for so long. And we know institutions have been here and maybe haven't announced that they're here, but they're certainly here. And it's it's fun to see, you know, some big names. Invesco manages a trillion dollars. It's really cool to see them there. All right. And we have James Safart. He was at Bloomberg Intelligence tweeting, there it is, Bloomberg's data team in the process of adding the ProShares Bitcoin strategy ETF to the terminal. Ticker will be BitTo, 95 basis points, less than half GBTC's 2% fee. This thing is going live next week, either Monday or Tuesday. So definitely very bullish there, already getting the uh, firm up there on the terminal. Um, so amid all this, you know, one of the interesting data points, Brad, was that there's huge demand for Bitcoin futures on the CME and that spot prices could follow. Tell me a bit about that. Well, I mean, the Bitcoin futures, I mean, by definition, they're a, a derivative. Uh, it's an ex uh, Futures is really an exchange-traded derivative contract. And just like, you know, soybean futures, oil futures, cocoa futures, they're designed to track the price uh, of the underlying commodity. And, you know, the I, it, 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 these contracts are designed, most of them, that you basically, if you 
agree to sell a futures contract, then at the end of the contract, you actually have to deliver the goods. You have to go out into the physical market and buy it in regular commodities markets. And so the, the idea is, you know, and some of these things are now financially settled, but the idea is, yeah, you may have, you may want to hedge. So you buy Bitcoin to hedge your futures position, and then you're kind of betting on the price. But the big picture is there are plenty of traders that know how to arbitrage these things. I mean, Goldman Sachs, Citadel. I mean, people know how to trade futures. <laughs> you know, that's what that's something Wall Street does. And um, so, yeah, the, what what will happen potentially is people will buy the Bitcoin. These ETFs will buy the Bitcoin futures, and then the, the Bitcoin futures price has some upward pressure. But then somebody will come in and be like, "Oh, okay, now the spot is cheap, so they'll buy Bitcoin." And eventually, yeah, th these things do travel in tandem. So, yeah, I mean. It, ETFs buying Bitcoin mm -hmm. futures is definitely going to drive up the price of Bitcoin. Yeah, Brad. Right. And, to and jump, can I go ahead, Christine? Sorry. Uh, to piggyback off what you're talking about there, it, there is a little bit of concern from people in the space talking about the fact that futures are going to be traded, that there is going to create a market for paper Bitcoins, and there may be an implicit addition to the 21 million cap that people are going to start trading on top of the Bitcoin uh, supply cap. So there may be a little bit of concern there. I think it's a bit overblown for now, but that is somewhat of a concern if we start having these big Wall Street firms coming in and trading paper Bitcoin. Crazy. All right. Uh, Brad, I wanted to ask you, who's doing the buying and selling? Is it retail versus institutional? And I'm talking about Bitcoin price in general. And, and is it more long-term holders or short-term holders? Uh, well, I, I, I probably, I, I'm not totally sure, uh, exactly what the answer is at the moment. I mean, speculators is the answer. Um, what we do know is that long-term holders are not selling. Uh, I, I was just reading how, you know, hodlers are, are at this point very comfortable. Uh, they don't, you know, I think we talked about a couple of weeks ago, we were in the 40,000 range and, that when prices got up to fifty thousand uh, dollars, a lot of people would want to. Uh, longtime hodlers would take the money off the table, and now we've blown through that level. Here we are; we're almost back up to the all-time high, close to sixty-five thousand again. And uh, you know, everything I'm reading, the hodlers are now hanging on. They 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 seem like mm -hmm. there's a lot more conviction now. There's no, there's not doesn't seem to be the same same temptation to sell at these levels. It seems like people are, are there's a little more conviction in this rally. Certainly. Well, we saw 60,000 as that resistance, but we've now blown past through that. So it is quite bullish out there. But I also want to take a look at some of the technical elements of the Bitcoin network. So let's take a look at the chart of the day. The chart of the day is brought to you by Crypto.com, the world's fastest growing crypto app. The Coindesk research team coming out with this beauty of a chart showing the United States becoming the world leader in Bitcoin mining, shown in uh, that kind of at the bottom there, that grayish, whitish color, which uh, while China, while in 2019 had as much as 75 percent of gold mining operations concentrated in the country, shown in teal and that, those columns there. And they've that's dropped off to zero in a matter of months, according to data from the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance. About 50% of Bitcoin hash rate, the computational power running the Bitcoin network effectively disappeared following China's crackdown on crypto mining over the summer. And remarkably, the Bitcoin network didn't skip a beat and the hash rate has recovered with the redistribution of mining power around the globe. Following the US, Bitcoin data centers in Kazakhstan and Russia cumulatively run about 18% and 11% of worldwide Bitcoin mining power, respectively. An honorable mention goes to Canada as well, shown in red there. So George, at one point, China was the epicenter of Bitcoin mining with as much as 75% of the world's Bitcoin mining. It's incredible that it just disappeared. But I, I, I just can't fathom that. I mean, there must be a couple of nodes running in there. I, I, you know, I heard, you know, after the crypto ban, a couple of shops started testing the waters, running nodes. I mean, do you think mining could ever recover in China? Yeah, this feels like the final nail in the coffin for Chinese mining, which is unfortunate. 
there were so many times in the past, I don't know, six years where China seemed to say, hey, no more crypto in the country. We're done with this. And it finally got to the point in the last quarter in Q2, actually, where China said no more mining and the hash rate dropped off and everyone took a collective breath and said, oh, my goodness, this is actually happening now. And we can see that it went from at the time in, in April, it was about uh, China had about 40 percent of the hash rate and it literally went down to zero. Now, you did point out that there were uh, it, it seems impossible that there's no more uh, mining in China at all. And there may be a possibility that some are operating with VPNs. We see Ireland pop up sort of out of nowhere and even Germany, mm -hmm. which is not really those two countries aren't known for having a lot of Bitcoin mining capacity at all. And there is speculation that it might be because of VPNs, just given how the Cambridge Center of Alternative Finance determines what the uh, geographic uh, vicinity of these miners is. However, that's speculation, and I'm not here to speculate. It is crazy, and it's exactly what you said, that we went from having 160 exahashes of, of mining power all the way down to 90, and it's not like the Bitcoin network stopped working. And then everyone took their miners from China and went to the U.S., Kazakhstan, and Russia, mm -hmm. and the Bitcoin network kept running. It's it, That's the really remarkable piece where we were able to take a big part of the financial infrastructure of Bitcoin and just move it to another country and nothing bad happened. Yeah, yeah the resiliency is remarkable. And, but did that impact the network in terms of high fees, lower transactions at all? Did it, I mean, was the user experience uh, impacted at all? Yeah, there's a really interesting thing happening right now in Bitcoin where we're seeing the price go up like crazy, but the transaction fees aren't following suit. It's as if the price of Bitcoin is going up, but no one is quote unquote using the first layer of Bitcoin. So we talk a lot about, I talk a lot about the Lightning Network and how that's a way to send Bitcoin cheaply. But really in the past six months, it's been really cheap to send regular way Bitcoin. Uh, it's actually a really interesting phenomenon to watch where if you want to send a regular way Bitcoin transaction, you could do it really cheaply right now. So uh, I'm really unsure what exactly that means. Brad talked a little bit about hodlers not really selling their Bitcoin. So maybe uh, a lot of people aren't willing to part with their Bitcoin. I would say to that, that hodling is in fact a use case. You don't have to necessarily use it to uh, use it, hmm. if that makes sense. Store of, store of value, store of wealth. All totally. right. And the United States has greatly absorbed the hash rate now, counting for about a third of the global computational power running the Bitcoin network. But is that too much concentration in the US? Or is this more of an even distribution? And, and then there are the arguments that this could lead to more sustainable Bitcoin mining, because that is uh, on the top of minds of many North American Bitcoin miners. Yeah, I think it's an interesting geopolitical conversation, right? Because we saw hash rate leave China and come into the United States, but we also saw it go into Kazakhstan and Russia. And Kazakhstan is very much a coal-fired country, and Russia is Russia. So whether that means that we're going to see even more come in the U.S. or go into Russia or go into Kazakhstan is a really interesting geopolitical question. Does the U.S. government want to take this as an opportunity to say, okay, China wants to get completely out of Bitcoin mining, let's become the superpower? I think at 33%, there may be a very good argument that it's still somewhat centralized uh, uh, ge from a geographical perspective. So, yeah, there could be more uh, spreading around of the wealth, I think. I was just going to say, I have a Go thought ahead, about, you, you know, I mean... People who follow the United States and live here and have watched our politics and, you know, know how things work. Um, money runs this country. You know, the politicians do what the people who are giving them money want them to do in general. I mean, we've seen that on the local level here in Texas. We talked about it last week where all of a sudden all of the politicians in Texas are agog over Bitcoin because there's all these business people in Texas who want to mine Bitcoin because they're energy people and they're all about like burning stuff and make and digging stuff up out of the ground and making money of, out of that. And they have power because money runs this country. And so that's a little different from China where the party runs the country. You know, obviously it's a, a little more nuanced than that, but uh, you know, 
the more Bitcoin mines that are going into the United States, the more power a crypto industry is going to have over Washington. I, that's my perspective. Mm. So, I, you know, like you're not going to see, I, I mean, you may see crypto regulations. You may see a crackdown coming more on the financial side, kind of banks fighting back. Uh, but in mm. terms of the Bitcoin mining, you know, these, the, you know, I mean, obviously Biden has his, environmental goals and he's not doesn't want you know a ton of coal fire power plants probably power, powering bitcoin that probably would not be a priority but in terms of bitcoin mining per se as a pursuit um pr probably not going to see the same ever see the same level of crackdown in the united states because they have money